Welcome back. Thank you. Again, welcome back. My name is, my name is John Cook. I'm the uh, director of the Federal Judicial Center, and we're very proud to uh, co-sponsor this program with the National Constitution Center. Um, just as an aside, uh, in addition to our mission to educate uh, federal judges and others about uh, their, their jobs, our statute uh, charges us with the study of federal judicial history. Uh, so this is a, a kind of a dual purpose uh, program for us. And in addition to the NCC Twitter site, I just cite you to the Fed Judicial Hist, uh, at Federal, Fed Judicial Hist on Twitter, and uh, you'll see daily updates on uh, issues uh, uh, affecting the federal courts uh, throughout our history uh, on that site. Now, uh, for our, our last panel this morning, uh, which is, sort of brings us up to today, I'm uh, very uh, privileged to be joined uh, by Chief Judge Diane Wood. Uh, she's Chief Judge of the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, sits in Chicago. Uh, she was appointed to that court uh, in 1995. And by uh, District Judge John Bates, uh, who is a district judge uh, in the District of uh, Columbia. Uh, he was appointed to his position in 2001. Uh, and as, in each of their roles, uh, Judge Wood currently serves as a member of the Judicial Conference of the United States. She's, uh, since she's been a chief judge, she's been in that role. Uh, judge Bates was the director of the administrative office of the United States courts from 2013 to 2015, and will return to those roles uh, and uh, those, those agencies, entities, in a couple of minutes. Uh, but uh, since our basic topic here is judicial independence, I thought I'd begin by asking uh, each of you, uh, what does judicial independence mean? And we've talked about, uh, Professor Burbank mentioned that it can't be in just an unconstrained uh, power. So what are, what are some of the limits on it that, that you see as judges? So Judge Wood, would you like to start? Well, thank you, John, and it, it's a real pleasure to be here. When I think of ju judicial independence in the positive sense, I think of the freedom to decide each case as it comes along in accordance with the law as I understand the law to be. And in some ways it may be helpful to think of what might prevent that from happening. Uh, and if one steps back and looks at the experiences of judiciaries around the world, you can see that sometimes there's a threat to independence that comes from political sources. Uh, it's, it's known that you hold your office at the pleasure of some political figure, a president, a prime minister, uh, a, a governing party, uh, and, and so we see examples where independence is compromised that way. We see examples where independence is compromised through economic factors. Uh, maybe a judge is just not paid well enough and so uh, there's a threat of bribes. We have a current issue that is brewing the judiciary um, from the economic standpoint, and it's this. Uh, as you may know, federal judges who have served at least 15 years and who have attained the age of 65, so it's a rule of 80, you add your service and your number of, uh, and, and your age once you hit 65, you can either retire or take senior status from the federal judiciary with your full salary, essentially, for the rest of your life. I'm oversimplifying only a little bit. Um, now, a lot of judges do, at some point after 65, when they attain that uh, status, they will take senior status, at which point they continue to sit as judges, sometimes with a full caseload. I have a colleague who's 92 who's still taking a full caseload, sometimes with a reduced caseload. Uh, and they're still subject to all the normal judicial rules. But what we're starting to see is people who leave the judiciary at 65 or 66, and they go back to a law firm, or they go into arbitration, or they do something else. And so people have begun to question, are they in some ways compromising their judicial independence because they see the next job down the road? 
I have no evidence that they are, and so I don't want to leave anyone with the impression that that's happening, but it's a question that is beginning to be asked uh, with increasing frequency. Uh, the third form of compromise is, a, is what I'll call a bureaucratic compromise. There are some, uh, some countries in which the chief judge has tremendous power over what the judges on that person's court do. I, let me assure you, I have zero power over what <laughs> the people on the Seventh Circuit do, zero. Um, but I can think of countries where if you're not pleasing the chief judge, you wound up being sent to some remote, uh, not particularly attractive part of that country, uh, and so on. So my, my last point is just to, s I, I give you this example only to show how extraordinary it is. Twice in my time in the Seventh Circuit, since 1995, I've actually been involved with a live case in which a member of Congress has tried to intervene in the case and tell the court what that member of Congress thinks we should do. And the first one involved, of all things, the identity of the person who was going to represent the United States in the Sydney Olympics in 2000 for the 75 kilogram weight class of Greco-Roman wrestling. <laughs> I didn't even know there was a sport called Greco-Roman wrestling until I got this case. But there had been an arbitration in Chicago, and so the case came to the federal courts in Chicago in the guise of an effort to enforce an arbitral award. And so our court, I was on the panel uh, with, of course, two of my colleagues, we ruled that a man by the name of Matt Lindland would be that person in the weight class. Well, this enraged uh, a member of the Senate, and he took it upon himself to write us a letter and tell us that we'd gotten it wrong, it needed to be the other guy. This is while the case is still pending. There was a petition for rehearing filed, and so we did file also uh, an opinion on the rehearing saying we actually didn't care what this member of the Senate had to say about this. Uh, I think we tried to say so politely. Um, uh, and then a lot of other things happened, and actually the funny coda to this is that uh, he did win the silver medal, uh, so we, we, <laughs> we chose well, and then he, had <laughs> then he had a career as a mixed martial arts fighter, and he nicknamed himself The Law. Uh, <laughs> so the very absurdity of it, I, I, I actually had one other occasion when this happened, but it's so unusual. Federal judges do not get pressured from either Congress or the executive branch to decide in a certain way. And I think I'll talk about accountability mechanisms maybe at a later point. There are many of them, uh, particularly if you're a lower court judge, it's called the Supreme Court. Uh, but if you're uh, in the federal judiciary, we have ways of handling that. Judge Bates? Uh, thank you for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I do think judicial independence definitionally has two parts. It's been uh, mentioned somewhat uh, already today. The individual or decisional independence, which is really uh, the ability to make fair and impartial decisions uh, free from uh, external influences. But there's also an in institutional judicial independence uh, uh, that is more thought of as part of the separation of powers, the capacity of the judiciary to serve as an autonomous uh, co-equal branch of government. And I think they're both important uh, when thinking about uh, judicial independence. There are some constitutional roots, but as you've heard from uh, uh, others today uh, and in the reading materials, uh, it's not all set out in the Constitution. It really has evolved over time, particularly on the institutional end. On decisional independence, uh, that fair and impartial decision-making, decision uh, it's not just independence from improper external influences, but it's also uh, fidelity to certain things. You have fidelity to uh, uh, the rule of law, uh, to basic fairness, uh, to appellate review, which is part of our process. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then there are other accountability and uh, uh, restraints uh, that uh, affect the judiciary, and we'll talk about some of them uh, here today, I think. Uh, and it's important to think of judicial independence on the individual side as having uh, both those accountability aspects uh, as well as those uh, uh, freedom from uh, external influence aspects. On the institutional side, uh, it can be complex. Uh, 
freedom from encroachment by the political branches is how I think most people would think of it. Uh, and therefore, preservation of the separation of powers. Uh, but uh, uh, there are only so many constitutional protections, tenure, salary, uh, advice and consent, probably is one as well. Uh, and a lot of this has evolved over time as uh, we've seen and heard in the reading materials. Uh, and uh, Chief Justice uh, and President Taft uh, obviously has had uh, a lot to do with that. Uh, but there have been these pressures on the judiciary institutionally over the course of our history. Uh, and they've been pretty significant at times. Uh, you know, reducing jurisdiction, court packing, uh, all of those kinds of things uh, have uh, really been threats to the judiciary. I do think the threats to the judiciary are probably a little greater now than they have been at some other times. Uh, I, I'm not sure that I fully agree that the uh, uh, that public officials don't occasionally uh, pose some threats to independent judicial decision making. I think that does sometimes occur, uh, but uh, the judiciary is pretty resilient, uh, and uh, uh, I have some confidence that uh, uh, things will work out all right, but it's going to take some effort, I believe, over the course of uh, the coming years. Uh, those are some initial thoughts on judicial independence. Well, I, I want to come back to some of that and to the, particularly to the accountability uh, piece. Um, we heard uh, in the last session about uh, Chief Justice Taft and his efforts uh, to establish some of the institutions that we now enjoy in the judiciary, particularly the Judicial Conference and the Administrative Office. Um, and Judge Wood, you're a member of the conference, and uh, Judge Bates, you had the, the pleasure, I guess, of being the director of the Administrative Office for a couple of years. Uh, uh, and a lot of our audience may not be as familiar with those those agencies and what they do. Could you just talk about them for a minute and how, how they support uh, judicial independence? Sure. Um, the Judicial Conference of the United States, which is what has evolved out of those original proposals um, by Chief Justice Taft, is a body chaired by the Chief Justice of the United States and it's comprised of the 13 chief judges of the circuits, circuits one through 11, plus the DC circuit, plus the federal circuit. And there is one district judge representative also from each of the circuits. It's a person from the Court of International Trade for the federal circuit. So altogether, 26 people chaired by the chief justice. It has standing committees that are designed to do everything that's needed for self-governance of the judiciary. And that's a very important part of this overall independence theme. Uh, the judiciary is not governed by some branch of the Justice Department. It's not governed off in the ether somehow. It has a very conscious self-governance uh, apparatus. So there's a budget committee. There's a committee on um, on resources for the courts. There, there are many committees that are standing committees including my, my old favorite one, the Standing Committee on Rules of Practice and Procedure. Um, there is also a committee on codes of conduct. So this committee is the expert committee on the set of rules by which judges are expected to comport themselves. And it will give advisory opinions to a judge who has a problem coming up and the judge wants to know, you know, is it okay if I go to this dinner, if I'm the honored guest and it's for Save the Whales, or what, whatever it may be. They will give uh, advice about this. They also publish a compendium of opinions, so you don't have to ask them to reinvent the wheel all the time. You can do some research yourself and see if the activity that is being uh, contemplated is consistent with the rules of ethics. There's also another committee with maybe a harder face on judicial conduct and disability. There is actually a statute that Congress passed that covers the topic of judicial conduct and disability. And that statute reflects the fact that the impeachment process, perhaps because of Justice Chase, perhaps because of the passage of time, is simply not really available for every last problem that comes up. And I think there's a sense that if the judge's problem is, let's say, Alzheimer's disease, the idea of impeaching a judge 
because that judge has Alzheimer's disease, seems to us in today's world a very harsh outcome. So the statute allows either kind of problem to be resolved. And it's actually the chief judge of the circuit that's the central actor in this, evaluating complaints that come in, appointing a committee if necessary, recommending to the circuit council, uh, which is the governing body inside each circuit, what to do. And it can ultimately go back to the judicial conference if need be, it can go and has gone occasionally to the House of Representatives for possible impeachment. But it's a very well elaborated process that any member of the public can initiate. You don't have to be some kind of specially privileged insider. And it's the judiciary's effort to say, we are trying to hold ourselves accountable to serious rules. Judge Bates. I'm going to go a little bit beyond the administrative office uh, to talk about the administration uh, and internal governance uh, that uh, Chief Judge Wood has mentioned uh, part of uh, and how that uh, relates to judicial independence. Uh, all of this, of course, comes in part from the Taft reforms uh, that uh, uh, helped to create a structure within the uh, uh, judiciary uh, with the Chief Justice at the head uh, and a hierarchical, even a bureaucratic structure, if you will, on the administrative side, uh, part of which is the establishment of the Judicial Conference, uh, and part of which in 1939 ultimately was the creation of the Administrative Office and the Director of the Administrative Office. Uh, the Administrative Office is part of the centralization if you will, of the administration and governance of the judiciary, uh, and it, uh, it's a an entity of about a thousand people usually, most of whom are located in the Thurgood Marshall building next to Union Station in Washington, uh, headed by the uh, director of the administrative office who's appointed by the chief justice with the uh, approval and agreement of the judicial conference. And as uh, John said, I had the, uh, uh, I'll say, pleasure and honor of uh, serving in that role at the request of uh, Chief Justice uh, John Roberts for uh, two years. Usually that position is not filled by a judge, uh, but there was a period where uh, uh, it was filled uh, by uh, uh, a judge. Uh, together with the administrative office though, there is the judicial conference and then there are the circuits. And they, they all work in tandem in terms of administration uh, and uh, internal governance. Uh, the administrative office supports uh, the uh, judicial conference and the committees of the judicial conference. Uh, as uh, Judge Wood said, there are 26, I think, uh, committees. Uh, and they cover a whole range of uh, topics. And I'm glad that uh, uh, Steve Burbank uh, mentioned the rules and uh, uh, the Chief Judge uh, Wood has mentioned the rules. And I do have the pleasure uh, right now of serving uh, as the chair of the Civil Rules Committee. Uh, and it's a wonderful committee. But all those committees are the way that policy issues percolate up in the judiciary, the national, if you will, the broad policy issues are developed through the committees and ultimately for the most part passed on by the Judicial Conference. And the Judicial Conference is that body of 26 uh, judges. It does change from year to year. The Chief Justice is the 27th member. I think there's only been one occasion uh, where the Chief Justice actually had to vote to break a tie. Uh, so he, not usually a voting member. And the uh, Director of the Administrative Office is the Secretary of the Judicial Conference. Uh, but the administrative office operates sort of like a small executive branch agency covering things like budget. Uh, it has the primary responsibility uh, for dealing with Congress on the budget and then responsibility for distributing that budget throughout the judiciary. Uh, information technology, HR, conduct and disability, uh, financial uh, uh, reporting, conflicts, uh, interface with the legislature on uh, uh, pieces of legislation. All of those things uh, are done through the staff at the administrative office. Uh, at, there is nothing more important than the budget, probably, in terms of uh, uh, an accountability constraint on the judiciary uh, and uh, administratively now within the judiciary. That is done mostly there dealing with Congress to pass the budget, uh, conduct, 
policy making, all of those are accountability constraints that I think uh, come out of this administrative and self-governance uh, process uh, that is a combination of the judicial conference, which includes all the circuit chief judges, the chief justice at the head of the administrative side of the uh, judiciary, the administrative office uh, with the director, there's an executive committee of the Judicial Conference that does a lot of the work of the Judicial Conference. Right now, that is headed by uh, uh, Merrick Garland, the Chief Judge uh, uh, of the DC Circuit. Uh, and uh, uh, that uh, is a very important uh, body for the administration and governance of the judiciary. But the Circuit Chief Judges are essential because a lot of the work, a lot of the administration, a lot of the governance takes place in the individual circuits. Uh, and I think you can't ignore the fact that it's a combination of centralization and a decentralized system uh, that gives a lot of the autonomy and power uh, and authority and responsibility to the various circuits uh, and particularly to the chief judge of the circuits. All of that, I think, uh, is uh, uh, a, uh, a part of uh, accountability uh, that uh, helps to preserve judicial independence. Both individually, it enables judges to focus on their docket and decide cases free from lots of worries and external influences, and institutionally, because those administrative and governance issues, uh, if they are stable, respected, and efficient, which I think they generally are, that means that we don't have external pressures in the same way, either from the other branches of government or the public. Let's come back to the accountability piece. And you've each touched on a couple of aspects of it. Um, but, uh, I think it would be useful to address uh, some of the, the jurisprudential uh, restrictions or limits on, on what you can do with a given case, and then on, again, besides the judicial conduct and disability procedures, what are some other ways that judges hold each other accountable for, for what they do? Either sure. Um, let's distinguish for the moment between the Supreme Court on the one side and everybody else on the other side. Such inferior courts as Congress shall from time to time ordain and establish. That's us. Um, for the district courts, for the courts of appeals, what I'll call substantive accountability. What's going to prevent a court from going off the reservation, imposing its views in a matter that maybe judges have no business talking about or in a manner that is inconsistent with either the Constitution or some statute that Congress has passed or some widely held understanding of Supreme Court jurisprudence, the simple answer to that is the appellate process. If there is the occasional rogue district court judge, and occasionally there is. Um, Why did you, you look my <laughs> way? <laughs> <Yeah>. You know. <laughs> you, you have a couple of tools. There can be an immediate petition for a writ of mandamus. And I can think of a couple of times when they have come to the Seventh Circuit. Um, I'll, the example that I'm thinking of is of a district judge somewhere in our circuit who was annoyed that the U.S. Attorney's Office in his district was going to drop a case. Well, the executive branch is the group in our system which has the responsibility to prosecute. So if the executive branch thinks that it should dismiss a case for reasons best known to itself, maybe lack of evidence, maybe an important witness isn't going to work out, whatever, uh, that's the executive branch's call. So this judge took the step of appointing a special prosecutor to continue the case. And there was an immediate petition for mandamus. We said, you're right. You know, this is the prerogative of the United States. We instructed the district judge not to do that. So that's, that's an off the reservation kind of example. Certainly at the Court of Appeals level, I'm sure you can think easily of the kinds of cases in which there's at least vigorous debate these days about how far can the courts go? Uh, what can the courts say about a travel ban? What can the courts say about religious monuments in public? What can the courts say about sanctuary cities? What can the courts say about 
any number of other topics, any of you in this room will have no trouble thinking of some examples. So these are hard questions. Reasonable people can disagree on them, but if the courts of appeals resolve those questions in a way that's incompatible with what the Supreme Court thinks, the Supreme Court will tell us so. Now, we are not unrealistic. We know that out of the 7,500 or so petitions for cert, petitions for review that come to the Supreme Court, it's only going to take 1%. Um, on the other hand, no circuit judge worth his or her salt has any trouble identifying from his own circuit or her own circuit the, the 10 or 20 cases that might attract Supreme Court attention. Most of the cases are unanimous. A study I did suggested that across the country in the courts of appeals, 97% are unanimous. So the Supreme Court's there. What holds them accountable? Scholarly opinion does. Congress does. Uh, I think a sense of the importance of the role. The justices are all well aware that, um, as, as the saying goes, you know, we're not um, final because we're infallible. We're infallible because we're final. I think that was Justice Robert Jackson who said that. So, so we have a lot of ways short of these formal processes to ensure fidelity to the law. I think it is fidelity to the law that it uh, is very important. Uh, the appellate process is obviously important. That, that belief in the rule of law uh, is something that I think all judges share, just as pretty much all judges share a belief uh, in the importance of uh, uh, judicial independence. Uh, let me uh, just step back a second. With respect to judicial independence, I've thought of one other definition of judicial independence. When I first came on the bench, two judges, one a former, well, one a former judge of the D.C. Circuit, another from the opposite side, uh, a present judge of the D.C. Circuit, each independently said to me, you will know when you are a f that you are a real federal judge the first time in a significant case that you decide against the president who appointed you. And I think there's some truth in that. I, I think that happens uh, maybe not every day, but it happens occasionally. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's a way to think about judicial independence. You're there not to follow a party line uh, or uh, the beliefs of uh, someone who got you into the position, uh, but to follow the rule of law uh, and to reach that fair and impartial uh, decision uh, based on the facts and the law before you. But there are all of these accountability uh, constraints on us, uh, both big and little. Uh, uh, certainly, fidelity to the law is uh, essential uh, to uh, how we uh, uh, hopefully conduct uh, ourselves. But there are constraints coming from you know, what Congress can do vis-a-vis -vis the budget uh, is an institutional uh, constraint. Uh, the executive has to, we hope, and thus far in our history, it's generally been true, setting President Jackson aside, uh, that the executive will carry out the orders of the uh, judiciary. Uh, and uh, there are constraints that occasionally come up uh, in terms of uh, these things like uh, possible court packing, jurisdictional uh, limitations, and so forth. Uh, all of those things exist institutionally, but I don't think individual judges think about that very much when they're deciding cases. Uh, they're influenced, I have no doubt, as the current empirical uh, uh, studies establish pretty much, they are influenced by all sorts of things uh, that are not 100% pure. Uh, they're in influenced by uh, their experiences, their background, uh, even their ideology. Uh, I think judges have to work hard to prevent too much influence from those things. Uh, but certainly studies have shown uh, that uh, those are influences on judges, those are pressures on judges. Uh, and we know uh, that the judicial confirmation process uh, is uh, uh, pretty much broken. Uh, but uh, certainly uh, uh, the primary thing uh, that the uh, uh, president uh, 
looks at when uh, picking a judge, uh, or the first thing at least, uh, is usually their politics. You know, where do they sit on the spectrum? 90%, I think uh, the studies show, 90% over the last 40 or 50 years, 90% of uh, uh, judges uh, have, been, have come from the party of the president nominating them. Uh, and uh, uh, in the Supreme Court, that's uh, uh, even a little higher these days. Uh, so there are lots of, lots of pressures, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's ultimately public opinion that does matter a lot. Uh, that is something that uh, uh, we cannot afford to lose. Uh, if public opinion, opinion uh, is lost, uh, if uh, uh, the public does not believe in the judiciary, uh, then I think uh, judicial independence is really at risk. As I think it was Steve Burbank mentioned, the judiciary still gets a little higher review from the public in terms of uh, uh, confidence. I think at the last Gallup poll, 2018 Gallup poll, put the judiciary at 68 percent, the, the executive at 45 percent, legislature at 35 uh, percent. Uh, that's significantly better, uh, but it's uh, uh, more and more at risk these days. Yeah, I'd like to pick up on that point. Uh, I've said elsewhere that one of the big, I think one of the big challenges facing the judiciary and public institutions generally is this uh, diminishing public trust in institutions across the board. Um, and while the judiciary fares better than our other branches in the, the, those polls, being on the top deck of a ship that's taking on a lot of water <laughs> is only a relative advantage. So uh, what, what, can, what can the judiciary and what can judges do to, to try to preserve that, that trust? There have been um, interest, well, there are two two ways of thinking about that, or two approaches. I don't think they're mutually exclusive at all. Uh, one of them is to build or perhaps rebuild the tradition of the judiciary of explaining carefully the reasons why a result is what it is in any given case, um, and doing one's work as much as possible in public. And by that, at the Court of Appeals level, what I mean is hold oral argument. Don't just have a case come into the maw and then emerge later uh, in a written format that no one knows anything about. No one knows where it came from. Was it written by a law clerk? Was it written by the judges? Did the judges ever really read the briefs? We may know internally what we do, and I'm very proud of the way the Seventh Circuit does its work, and I'm sure my colleagues on other circuits feel exactly the same, but public accountability means letting the public understand and see what you're doing. And I think the pressures of increasing caseloads have caused the judiciary to adopt lots of practices in the name of efficiency that we're starting to see have come at some cost uh, on the dimension of transparency. And I think we need to redouble our efforts and get back out into the open and make sure that the public knows that we're doing the job that we were uh, assigned to do when we were given the honor of serving as federal judges. Now there's a different approach. Many courts in the country, and we're all being encouraged to do this, are also trying different forms of outreach to schools, to uh, students, to younger people, all in the nature of improving civics education. I think that's all fine, but, but I actually think at, at its heart, we need, to, we need to do better ourselves in, in our core job. And I will just, this is a footnote to what John just said. Um, I think another safeguard in terms of making sure that both the independence and the accountability criteria are being met is the fact that at least at the Court of Appeals level, um, no judge does anything by him or herself. Nothing happens until at least two members of a panel of three agree on the outcome. So we are constantly dealing with people with different life experience, with different political backgrounds perhaps, and it's our job to sit there and carefully and courteously come to a decision. And we do most of the time. 
And that's not a constraint that uh, applies as directly on the district court level, uh, although there are certainly uh, peer pressures uh, that exist. Uh, but, I th but I think that uh, on the appellate level, that is an important constraint. Uh, you need to get someone else to agree with you, although it may be that one other person agrees and one other person doesn't agree. Uh, so it's not an overwhelming uh, uh, quorum. Uh, I, th I think that we have to think not just of how the judiciary uh, collectively acts. That's very important. We need to educate the public. We need to be engaged uh, with public education. Uh, transparency, uh, explanations for our decisions, explanations for what we do are, are essential. And I fully agree uh, that we need to be uh, having more arguments on the appellate level, uh, on the district court level as well, that sometimes is true. Uh, a lot of district judges are very busy uh, and they don't hear argument in that many cases. Uh, but to the extent that time uh, allows, I think uh, letting the public see the judiciary in action is very important. Now, judges don't have the same platform in terms of speaking out uh, to defend judicial independence or other important doctrines. Uh, there has been some uh, recent uh, activity by members of the Supreme Court. Uh, you're probably, most of you are familiar with Chief Justice uh, Roberts uh, recently saying that we don't have Obama judges or Trump judges, Bush judges or Clinton judges, and really defending the independence of the judiciary uh, and that that's something that is very important. Uh, he's not alone in saying that. I think Justice Sotomayor, uh, elsewhere in Pennsylvania, at, at Duquesne, out in Pittsburgh, uh, recently uh, uh, spoke uh, along the same lines, saying that judges don't belong to a president or a party, uh, but to the rule of law. Uh, and observing that, yes, there are a lot of five to four decisions. Are they partisan? Justice Sotomayor said, not really. What they are is uh, there's a toolbox, uh, and uh, judges approach judicial decision making based on utilizing the tools in the toolbox, and different judges use different tools uh, and reach different conclusions. Unfortunately, as she admitted, many of those tools are associated with one or the other side uh, of uh, the political spectrum. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it's an important concept. And, Justice Kavanaugh, in his confirmation hearings, spoke to judicial independence, uh, called it the first quality of a good judge, uh, not to be swayed by uh, political or public pressure. And he mentioned uh, cases that have been mentioned here today. Uh, Youngstown Steel. These are cases in which he observed the judiciary, the Supreme Court uh, he was talking about, uh, needed to have backbone. Youngstown Steel, uh, with a president during wartime wanting to do something. Uh, I think you could look to Brown v. Board of Education. The political pressures were enormous there, uh, and the Supreme Court issued a unanimous decision. And then uh, the uh, United States versus Nixon case, uh, where a chief justice appointed by President Nixon uh, got a unanimous uh, court uh, to decide that uh, the president had to respond to a criminal trial subpoena uh, and disclose information. And those are important things to bear in mind, but the judiciary can't do it all alone. Uh, this public education, public defense of judicial independence uh, needs to be done by the bar uh, as much or more than the judiciary. Uh, it, it is generally. Uh, we need uh, uh, bar organizations, leaders of the bar, to speak up uh, and uh, defend judicial independence against the threats that are currently posed. The threats aren't unique to this time. They're a little different, perhaps. I mean, uh, we probably have more public official criticism of judicial conduct and particular judges uh, and what they've done or courts and what they've done, uh, high public officials criticizing that uh, than has been true in recent history. Uh, but it's not unique. Uh, and presidents have problems with judicial decisions that the Supreme Court issues frequently. Most recent presidents, uh, I'll think of two examples, have said, well, not two presidents, 
one who wanted to be president, Vice President Gore, uh, at the conclusion of the Bush v. Gore case said, I disagree with it, but I accept it. And President Bush, uh, there, a couple of years thereafter, when he faced some defeats from the Supreme Court dealing with uh, uh, the uh, counterterrorism uh, measures, uh, first in the Hamden case, and it wasn't really an equal battle, it was the president in wartime against the former driver and bodyguard of the most despised terrorist uh, ever, Osama bin Laden. That's not exactly an equal uh, battle, but when the Supreme Court decided that a military commission was not properly formed uh, to, to uh, prosecute uh, that individual. Uh, and then later, when uh, in other cases, the Supreme Court uh, said uh, uh, that uh, the treatment of Guantanamo uh, uh, detainees was not uh, proper under the Constitution, President Bush said, I disagree, but I accept the decision of the Supreme Court will follow it. Uh, so presidents have problems with Supreme Court decisions. President Obama did in a, a State of the Union speech once. Uh, but uh, uh, I think we're facing a little bit more in terms of really focused public criticism of ju particular judges on particular decisions and courts all the way down to the inferior courts uh, than we have before. And it's much more personal. Uh, and I think that that uh, does pose more of a threat to judicial independence uh, than uh, uh, we've seen in recent years. And we need the public, forums like this and other forums, uh, to uh, help to speak out uh, to defend judicial independence. You've, you've both touched on uh, recent comments by the Chief Justice and Justice Sotomayor. There's not Obama judges or, or uh, Bush judges. Uh, at the same time, uh, confirmations are, are political Armageddons, uh, which uh, suggests that this is going to be the end of the universe if, uh, if this person gets confirmed or doesn't get confirmed. So there's kind of a disconnect there. How do we, how do, is, there a, is there an answer to that? You know, John, I think what you're touching on in some ways is media and in some ways is reality. And I just, I want to link what you said to what John was just mentioning about the five to four decisions and take it all the way back to the judge's bill of 1925. In 1925, we made a huge public policy decision, which was that the Supreme Court was not going to be an error correction body. It wasn't going to be a regular old court. It was going to be a body devoted to resolving the most difficult legal issues the most important legal issues we have coming before the country. And that turned it, frankly, into a body with pretty large political valence. It, it, we need somebody to be the last word on these questions. Going all the way back to Marbury, we've decided that it's going to be the Supreme Court. And I would defy any of you sitting in this room who is not a judge, if I were to give you a plate of 8,000 cases, and I told you all, pick out the 80 that you think are the most important ones, and let's see how you come out on them. You might be the equivalent of five to four. These are tough issues. They're, they're issues that reasonable people are going to resolve differently very often, maybe not always. But it, it's that very selectivity that causes us to have these pressures that we have today. The media likes a good story, of course. They like to portray you know, contending factions and people who can barely stand each other. Although if you listened to Justice Ginsburg and the late Justice Scalia, they were the best of friends. They understood they had different viewpoints. They each sharpened one other's, the other one's opinions. Uh, and helped each one make the best case for that viewpoint that could be made. So, so it isn't really this pitched battle. The confirmation process, televised as it is, all of this, you know, we want a, a good story, is, is also something that perhaps sometimes there really is a serious matter that should be investigated. Perhaps sometimes it doesn't require quite the breathless uh, approach that's given to it. I think the only thing I can say is I remember, and, and actually my confirmation process was very tame compared to some of what's been going on. Um, 
But I remember thinking the day I walked in, finally once and for all confirmed that I had just been through what was easily going to be the most political period of my life. I told people that I felt like a bill. Um, and But then it was over. I was able to shut the door. I have these wonderful protections from Article 3 of not really life tenure, as Justice Blackman reminded me, uh, serving during my good behavior. Um, <laughs> hopefully I've lived up to that. Uh, and, and the salary protection. So I think difficult though it is, and I worry about whether people are deterred from standing to be uh, a judge because they don't want some particular you know, ill-advised incident when they were a college sophomore to be aired. I, mean, I, I don't know, I mean, but we might be paying a price for this kind of attention. Uh, yeah, I, I think we are paying a little bit of a price. The, the confirmation process is extremely polarized. It's uh, uh, to some extent broken, but it's a reflection of our society, which is polarized. It's not the cause of the polarization. It's just a reflection of it. Uh, so how do we deal with that? Uh, we, uh, you can't just focus on the confirmation process and think you can fix that. Uh, it's the uh, overall polarization in the country. And uh, I, I don't have an answer for how we get that back into a more civil discourse and uh, ability to make compromises, uh, uh, work with each other. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that uh, is a real problem for us uh, as a society. Uh, the confirmation process for inferior courts it still works pretty well. Although, if you look at it these days, you can see that a lot of the judges going on to the appellate courts are by votes that are split right down the middle, Democrat and Republican. Uh, almost exactly. You might have one or two people shifting sides, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's really uh, a, an, an amazing thing that has happened. That was not true uh, 10 years ago. Uh, I mean, I'm not controversial, obviously. Uh, not important is the more important point uh, as a district court judge. Uh, and uh, I had been uh, a, uh, a member, I was actually the deputy independent counsel uh, for the uh, Whitewater investigation very political uh, event. Uh, and uh, nonetheless, I was unanimously confirmed by the Senate, including Hillary Clinton as one of, the, one of those senators. That wouldn't happen these days. That just wouldn't happen today. Uh, and uh, I, I don't have an answer for how we fix that other than uh, education for the, to the public and uh, you know somehow uh, starting to uh, work better together. I know that's a sad note. Well, it is a sad note, and, and one has to ask whether the nature of the nominees has changed as well, because um, back in the day of the filibuster, you know, you did have to find nominees who were going to attract some support from the other side, so it might have had an institutional pressure to find people who were not out at the extremes of whichever party happened to be in control. Um, I think it's, this is not a, a, a party comment, it's a structural comment. So if you had to find somebody who was somewhere in the middle, then the chances of getting a stronger vote were, were also there. I think if you're gonna pick the most extreme Democrat or the most extreme Republican, you're, you're changing the nature of the process. Over the course of the morning, we've gone from the, be you know, the beginnings of the Republic and a very tiny judiciary that basically consisted of, of a few judges and justices to the beginning of the 20th century, uh, where the start of a larger apparatus grew. And now today, we have a federal judiciary of about 2,000 judges and about 25,000 employees um, and the structure that we've described. What do you see next? Do you, do you see this changing at all? Uh, let's look internally. We've been talking about the external forces that deal with the, that affect the judiciary, but what, what, is, what can or should the judiciary be doing itself to change how it operates, or maybe not at all? 
Well, when, uh, you're including the bankruptcy judges and yeah, the magistrate right, judges. Right. So, so one thing that has happened is we've moved from a judiciary in which we have just Article Three judges, district judges, appellate judges, Supreme Court justices, to a judiciary that includes two very important groups of judges who do not have the life tenure and uh, salary protection from the Constitution. Those are the bankruptcy judges who are selected by the Court of Appeals in each circuit on a merit basis, and they serve for a 14-year term. You know, you can do the arithmetic yourself, two 14-year terms, 28 years, that sounds like a pretty good career. But they don't have the, the, the same Article III protections. And the bankruptcy court itself is technically a division of the district court, so that, that's kind of where it parks. And we also have magistrate judges who do a lot of different things. It depends on how the district judges and how the district court wants to handle things, but uh, a wide variety of actions in support of the district court up to and including, if there's consent, actually holding a jury trial and resolving the case, but managing discovery or doing arraignments or doing you know search warrants or, or a whole huge number of things they do. So in other words, one answer to our problem has been to expand the judiciary uh, as the demand for federal judicial services in, uh, increases. I think there's a bit of a schizophrenia about whether we really want cases in the federal courts or whether we are happy to rely on our colleagues in the state courts, and we haven't talked much about them, but we should be talking about them because they do 90% of the judicial business in the United States. They're crucially important, and there's a real variety of ways in which the state judges are selected. They don't have the kinds of independence protections we have, and yet, on the whole and by and large, they serve independently, with some sobering reminders, such as you know the voters voting out a bunch of judges on a state Supreme Court because they didn't like the outcome of an opinion. That has happened more than once. Uh, so there are other proposals that would send more cases into the federal courts, maybe every case in which at least one person is from a different state. There are some proposals that would strip jurisdiction from the federal courts and say you shouldn't be in the, you know, some business or another. The federal courts on the whole and by and large don't do family law and probate and some of these other areas, which are of course important to people, but they're not our business. Um, the federal courts are increasingly clunky as a forum for resolving small claims experienced by a large number of people. Uh, you know, your classic claim where you, you paid $15 extra for your rental car at the airport, uh, but who's going to sue for $15 when the filing fee is $400? I mean, you're not going to do it. You're just going to grumble and take your loss. There was a class action rule, there is still a class action rule that theoretically allows this to happen, but it's not, it, it's becoming more difficult to use. So we're either going to have to rely more on the state courts for things, or we're going to have to say we need to find better structures in the federal courts, whether it's through more judges, whether it's through better procedures. I'm not sure that these efficiency measures, though, are the answer. I do think it's important to think of state courts in this context. Uh, more cases are decided in state courts, obviously, many more uh, than in uh, uh, federal courts. And the state courts and judges are under uh, greater pressures often uh, than are the uh, federal courts and federal judges uh, through the uh, electoral process uh, or through legislation uh, in some states to uh, uh, curtail uh, the independence and decision making of judges. Uh, lots and lots of uh, uh, statutory uh, attempts uh, in the uh, state courts to uh, uh, really uh, tamp down on judicial independence. And uh, uh, I think we need to be concerned uh, about that. Uh, I'll sort of take a different approach uh, and more of an internal, uh, what's going to happen internally within the judiciary uh, with respect to some of these uh, self-imposed constraints. And I think we are doing some things uh, that help uh, the public's uh, perception of the judiciary. Uh, some of them are perhaps a long time coming, uh, but uh, I think of the uh, uh, recent efforts with respect to uh, uh, addressing uh, a structure for uh, 
any uh, sexual harassment or similar uh, complaints about uh, uh, treatment of employees. Uh, and there was a, uh, the Chief Justice uh, uh, initiated uh, uh, something that came in the uh, wake of uh, a bad incident uh, involving the federal judiciary, uh, but uh, uh, initiated uh, uh, a, uh, a group to look at that, and they came out with a report. Now each of the circuits is looking very seriously, uh, and some have already uh, come up uh, with uh, revised plans. Uh, I think that kind of uh, uh, internal addressing of conduct issues is important. Our conduct and disability process uh, is continually being tweaked uh, and uh, uh, being made more robust. It's important. Uh, it happens both at the circuit level and at uh, a committee of the uh, judicial conference level. Uh, it gets a lot of public attention when something uh, becomes public with respect to uh, uh, a judge's uh, disability or uh, inappropriate conduct. Uh, putting on my rules hat for a second, uh, I, I do think that uh, we're looking uh, at uh, some of the things about the federal docket uh, and whether unique rules are necessary for those unique areas. Uh, we have an enormous percentage of the federal court docket in what is called multi-district litigation cases. Uh, these are collective cases uh, given to a particular judge uh, to handle uh, the, the preliminary uh, uh, activity in the case, but the preliminary activity is often the heart of the case. Uh, discovery, uh, motions, uh, maybe even settlement. Uh, those multi-district litigation cases account for over 40 percent of the federal cases. It's an amazing number uh, that are in the multi-district litigation. We also have like 18,000 Social Security cases filed every year. Uh, and on the rules side, we're looking at, uh, okay, do we need to do something with respect to rules that are usually transubstantive? They aren't specific area rules. But do we need to consider something for these unique areas of the federal docket uh, that are either without rules, the MDL process doesn't really have a distinct set of civil rules, uh, or maybe you need uh, special rules for uh, something like Social Security. Now, we've resisted that in other places, patent uh, cases, for example, uh, but it's something that we're always looking at and seeing if there are improvements uh, that will uh, give justice more efficiently uh, and more fairly uh, and uh, the Secondary uh, uh, result of that is uh, that it uh, improves the uh, perception of the federal courts in terms of uh, how they are dispensing justice. We have about two minutes left, so I'll ask each of you if you have any last thoughts of hope, despair, inspiration, mm -hmm. uh, whatever. My sense is that the underlying health of the federal judiciary is very good and that we are very fortunate to have um, a group of judges, all of these judges, these 2,000 judges you're talking about, which honestly for a country of whatever we are now, you know, 330 million people, isn't that many. Um, they, they are doing a great job. I do think um, that the public's confidence in the judiciary isn't what I would like to see and I think Part of that is based on legitimate complaints. You know, we, we are not doing enough to make ourselves visible. And we can't expect people, you know, to march down to the courthouse every Tuesday and, and find out what's happening. There's more streaming of cases. There's more televising. I mean, we're trying to move into the, tw our, our panel's called the 21st century. So I'll make a 21st century point. Uh, the Ninth Circuit pioneered this uh, streaming of, of all of its oral arguments, but the Second Circuit now does it in some cases, the Third Circuit now does it in some cases, our court, the Seventh Circuit has adopted it for some cases with the thought that we will also revisit this and perhaps uh, take the next step and go along the Ninth Circuit's line. Uh, we're using video appearances more. We're trying to make things, in short, uh, accessible to people so that they will see what we're doing and if they're interested they'll you know they can read the briefs they can make their own mind up and I think they would be very pleased with what they saw 
and I agree that uh, technology is a tool that is important for the judiciary to use uh, to educate and to uh, do its job better. Of course, technology, in particular social media, also poses a threat to the judiciary because that's a way uh, that some of the criticism of the uh, uh, judiciary, particular judges in, uh, uh, most especially, uh, can really be magnified. Uh, and uh, uh, it can be a, a real pressure. But what I'd like to do is, is tie this back historically a little bit. I too am confident that the federal judiciary is uh, an extremely capable, principled uh, group uh, and uh, will continue uh, to act independently, uh, both institutionally and individually on cases. I have every confidence in that. But that's not to say that there aren't a lot of pressures. There are a lot of pressures. And the pressures are fairly severe in some quarters. Uh, and there's a risk. Uh, there's a risk of, of eating away at the rule of law, eating away at uh, judicial independence. Uh, and that's not easily recovered if it is impacted. Uh, and I think back to uh, Hamilton. Uh, when uh, he said, in, in basically saying that there isn't a reset button in, the, in this context, you can't lose judicial independence. Once the independence of judges is destroyed, the Constitution is gone. It is a dead letter. It is a vapor which the breath of faction in a moment may dissipate. And I think we need to bear that in mind and work hard to preserve judicial independence and the rule of law. Uh, because uh, it is a foundation of our constitu constitutional democracy. Well, that's an excellent point to end on. Please join me in thanking Judge Wood and Judge Bates. <laughs>